Welcome back to History B354, The Reformation. Now, the reason I say welcome back is because I hope by uh, this point in the course, um, which is just the very beginning, because this is the first lecture of the first week of the course, but that you will already have listened to the talk or the lecture um, in terms of getting started, welcome and getting, getting started, and we'll have looked through some of the course material, the syllabus, and the introduction to the course, so that I hope by this time you have some kind of a, uh, an understanding of what this course is about as I have constructed it, um, what the requirements are, how we're going to go about uh, dealing with this course, and the, the, in some ways the, the structural parameters of this course. What I want to do today in this opening lecture for this course is to set, let's say, the content parameters. So not just the requirements and due dates and the assignments and those types of things and the readings. But when we get into the content of this course, what is this course? When we get into the content, what period of history does it cover? How are we going to understand it? And the title of this introductory lecture for the course is Introduction with a common uh, colon, then Reformation or Revolution, question mark. That's I think is what says on the PowerPoint slides going along with this, but if you look at the syllabus, uh, it gives a little bit more detail in that the title of the syllabus for this first lecture is Introduction, colon, the Reformation as Revolution, question mark, Theology, Religion, Politics, and History. Now, those are all aspects that we'll be dealing with throughout this course, and I'll address how we're going to, or should, for the purposes of this course, in any case, conceive of those terms, what they're referring to, and what they have to do with the Reformation. But that question, Reformation or Revolution, is in some ways the theme running throughout this course. And it will culminate in your final exam. So I just want to read to you the final exam, if you haven't read it already. Um, and I may have already done this in the, in the welcoming lecture. I'm not sure if I did or not. I can't remember if I uh, did or not. But this will be your final exam, which is posted, ready to go. You can begin work, working on it as soon as you start the course. And the final exam consists of one question. There's an essay for 12 to 15 pages as a minimum. And that question is as follows. Was the Reformation in its religio-theological, political, social, cultural, and intellectual aspects, a revolution? If so, how so? If not, how not? How should the transformation of European society and culture from medieval to early modern best be described? You can say, wow, that's, uh, that's more than a 12 to 15 page essay. And yes, it is. It can be books and books and books. And in some ways, that is the question that encapsulates most of the scholarship on the Reformation from the 16th century till today. Not even in explicit terms, but it's trying to come to an understanding of what happened and what led to this change because Europe in 1300 was very different from Europe in 1600 and somehow the religious and theological developments during that period were a major contributing factor. But how much of a contribution were those? And do they suffice to be able to say that is how we can understand this difference that we see in terms of historical change from Europe in 1300 to Europe in 1600? Now, what does all that mean? Now, there is a term there in the final, which I uh, did not address explicitly in the slides for today's lecture, um, and that is the term culture. Now, why is that? Because culture is a difficult term to uh, deal with. In some ways, it includes everything. It includes the intellectual, the political, the theological, the, the religious, the social, the whatever. All kind of come together to form culture. And there's a lot of scholarship on culture, the meaning of culture, the difference between human civilization and human culture. There was human culture before there was human civilization as a particular form of culture. And there was civilization before there was Western civilization. 
Um, and there was Western civilization before we get to this period of late medieval, early modern, and the transition from one to the other, and how we get there and got there and all of those good things. This is all about historical understanding. And the terms we use to describe what we observe, I'll be talking more about this shortly. The terms we use to describe what we observe affect what it is we re observe in the sense of our understanding of it. If we call the Reformation, or this period European history, 1300 to 1600, a revolution, that has a very different connotation in terms of how we understand the period than if we just call it a period of Reformation, or if we call it a period of disintegration. You say, what do you mean, disintegration? Exactly what we will see throughout this course how we certainly could refer to it as that to describe the historical developments. That is imposing an understanding and a description on these developments, but so is the term the Reformation, and so is the term revolution. Those are the issues we're trying to deal with, and how to deal with all these things historically, as opposed to theologically, politically, religiously, socially, whatever we have it. And so if we want to begin to approach this period, which again is approximately 1300 to approximately 1600, and to account for the change that we see in the sources and how to understand that change and what led to it, which is what doing history is, as I'll be addressing more. We need to look at the terms that we use and the terms that have been used and in some ways to question what this course is that has the title of the Reformation. Is there such a quote-unquote historical phenomenon or phenomena that can be described as the Reformation? And if so, what is it and what is a, a Reformation of and how do we approach the very term and concept under which this course is being taught. Now, I hope that kind of sets the stage. And in so many ways, the rest of this lecture is designed to set the stage for, the, let's say, the real work that's coming up throughout the rest of the semester leading up and culminating in your final examination, where you are required to address that question explicitly based on everything that has gone on in this course, everything you've learned, everything we've covered, to come up with an understanding that you can defend based on the evidence presented in the course material, the lectures, the readings, and the textbook. I hope that kind of helps. So to begin today, after this introductory little bit, um, I want to ask a question. What is the Reformation? Is there such a thing, or was there such a thing as the Reformation? And what do we do about that concept? How do we understand it? So here we go to slide two. The Reformation, with the in quotation marks, and a quotation and a question mark at the end. So often scholars have made, tr traditionally have made, a distinction. The distinction between Reform and Reformation. What is that distinction? We refer to, often scholars refer to late medieval reform movements as opposed to the Reformation of the 16th century. But what was the Reformation of the 16th century? Was it just Martin Luther? There's a footnote. If you really haven't heard of Martin Luther, don't know who he was, um, that's fine. There's no prerequisites for this course. Uh, you certainly will come to know him uh, to, to, to a fairly uh, good extent in the course of this course. Uh, and so often it's seen as Martin Luther having a, begun and initiated this Reformation, um, turning away from medieval reform movements, and on we go. And that's part of the problem. problem with the concept of reform as distinct from Reformation, because what constitutes reform and why designate late, this late medieval reform as something distinct from what was to come in, in the 16th century. And then why is it just late medieval? Because it isn't the church always, the church, I'll come back to those concepts, always been in a, in a period of reforming. There was a formulation um, 
that was used, uh, I forget, um, Hans Kung, I don't think was the first, but he adapted it. Uh, but I think it, he took it from a, actually a Protestant uh, scholar and theologian whose name I think I know, but I can't come up with off the top of my head right now. Um, that formulated, I think Karl Barth, maybe even been Karl Barth, anyway, that formulated it as the church is reformed, but always needs to be reformed. Ecclesia reformata semper reformanda. The church reformed always to be reformed. That means that the entire history of Christianity is an ongoing or has been an ongoing process of reforming the church at the time. So what makes this reformation different? And was there something in the 16th century that was qualitatively different from the ongoing reforms that had come before? No. That's part of the question. And whether it was simply one development 